this is, I guess, our 14th episode, which is actually an addendum because I forgot a couple things. And then uh, Johnny had a question. If anybody else has a question, I'm happy for uh, uh, to address a question because I think this will wrap up our study on spiritual warfare. And I do want to say, um, well, first, thank you for tuning in all season, all, all the time uh, that you have, because that means a lot to me. I enjoy it uh, very much. And I think uh, there probably will be some degree of future Zoom study, but at the moment, I think I'm going to start teaching a class in June at church. And so I'm going to let that take the attention for now, uh, for uh, my attention and trying to get ready because I have a few things, few irons in the fire, and I think it'd be helpful to uh, concentrate on on just a few at a time. And then the uh, second thing, though, I want to mention, there's always more to talk about with spiritual warfare. I mean, I I sit around and think myself of questions that I should have researched and addressed. And so if you have questions come up, I'm happy to answer them tonight and maybe some future, you know, addendum to if we need to or whatever, because some just need more attention than others. And tonight is kind of like that. The the two I thought of that um, I think are important is uh, first, we should discuss guardian angels, I think, a bit, because I really didn't bring that up at all. And that's sort of a, uh, to me, a pseudo spiritual warfare discussion, not from the, so much the warfare, but just uh, we talk about guardian angels a lot. People do. And I think it's important to address that. The second one I want to address is the uh, the formation or new creation or new representation of angels that some people believe in that I didn't address. And I'll explain that more when we get to that. And then Johnny had the question as to whether Satan can uh, know our thoughts. Is that correct? Was that the right question? Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure. And so I'll address that too, because I think that's another key question, especially in our spiritual warfare realm. And then Two weeks ago, when I uh, had done what I thought was the wrap up of our discussion on spiritual warfare, I actually sort of kind of forgot to mention the part about what to do if you feel like you're under spiritual warfare in terms of Satan attacking you or Satan's uh, uh, minions. And so I want to address those things tonight. So we'll start with the trivia question Who was the servant of Elisha who? Um, committed a sin and became leprous the name please not just the servant because i already already said that so and then uh we'll move on from there with a couple of points of discussion on guardian angels and then do the others we talked about so anybody happen to know that off the top of your head yet I haven't heard the answer yet Be sure to unmute about that time. It's in the Bible. It is actually in the Old Testament that narrows it down to, you know, 39 books. Uh, I can tell you this. It's not in Nahum. We'll narrow it down here gradually. I love saying the name Habakkuk, but it's not in the book of Habakkuk either. But I'm going to look at Second Kings. I'll narrow it down to that. Okay, it's close. Because yeah, very and you know there are repetitious stories. I mean that's why most people don't really know, but yet they know what's in First and Second Chronicles because it's largely the same historic history as First and Second Kings, with the uh, added nice exception in my mind of quite a bit of genealogy in First Chronicles. Um, I've always thought that we ignore the uh, the genealogies in the Bible largely because the names get challenging, but there are so many fascinating details in the genealogies. It's it's kind of um, it's kind of fun, actually. I think, but then uh, not everybody thinks the same, so I don't tend to discuss it much. But we'll uh, go to Second Kings where. Uh -huh. it Jehazi. Yes, Jehazi. Very good. Jehazi was the one. So let me real quickly go over that answer because this is an important thing for our study too. 
And that, I'm going to start saying Kings 5-1, not because that's where the answer is, but the answer actually is at um, maybe first mentioned best at 2 Kings 5-19. And then when he became lepers was at 2 Kings 5-27. So uh, those are that's the answer. But 2 Kings 5-1, now Naaman was commander of the great army of the king of Aram. Okay, so that was... Uh, a significant part of the upcoming story, which we'll be discussing uh, in a moment in terms of spiritual warfare. And then down at verse, um, let's go over to just to save time. Um, yeah, you know the story of Naaman. He was leprous and he didn't want to wash in the Jordan as the servant girl from Israel that worked for him had told him that there's a great prophet in Israel that could save him. Of course, that was Elisha. So down at verse 13, Naaman, Naaman's servants, after Naaman didn't want to wash in the river Jordan, Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to go do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman said to his attendants and all his attendants, excuse me, went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know there's no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. And of course, this is, that goes along the lines of false gods, true God, uh, Jehovah God being the one true God and nations often having gods. That's why he felt like of all the gods in the world, this was the one true God. Uh, for Israel. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I would not accept the thing, even though Naaman urged him, he refused. So, uh, if you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. May the Lord forgive your servant this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimmon, that was one of the false gods we talked about, to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Jehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master is too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I'll run after him and get something from him. So Jehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot and said, Is everything all right? Everything's all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, Two young men from the company of prophets just came from the hill country. Be firm, please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing, in which, of course, would need to fit Gehazi, I feel sure. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them. He tied up two talents, silver, and two bags, two sets of clothing, gave them to two of his servants, they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he put the things from the servants, took them, and put them away in the house. He sent the man away, and they left. They went in, said before his master, Elisha, where have you been? Gehazi, who was Gehazi last time I said it. Elijah asked, your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot, chariot to meet you? Is this the time to make money or to accept clothes, olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, men servants, maid servants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Jehazi went from Elisha's presence and he was leprous, white as snow. Presumably he learned his lesson. So that itself has a number of spiritual warfare implications, including mentioning the worship of Rimmon in Aram. So let's go down to chapter 6. This will be 2 Kings 6, verse 8. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. Nothing odd about that. These people were always fighting. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place, which is where I went on my last vacation. <laughs> the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. 
He summoned his officers and demanded of them, will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, uh, the king said his officers, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he's in Dothan, so he sent horses and chariots, you know, strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the, the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Do not be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So this is the lead up to the famous story of the chariots on the mountain and the angels of God and the spiritual forces. And I want to mention first before I read it, this is what I generally find most people discuss as the primary evidence of guardian angels. So when I think of a guardian angel and from discussion with people, what I believe most people have a perception of is an angel that's assigned to an individual to protect that individual from harm. Does that sound like a reasonable definition from what you understand too? And, you know, I think that's mostly what we talk about. When we hear guardian angel, I don't think there's anything different than that. So if you look at scripture, this is the primary example. So I'm going to read it and then we'll discuss that further. So don't be afraid, verse 16, the prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. And this was a, um, a classic, God does this in a meaningful way type of passage too. Because not only did he open the eyes of the servant to see God's spiritual forces, but he then closed the eyes of the enemy so that they couldn't see even physical earth sources. So it's kind of poetic. You know, you take away blindness and you give blindness and i i find that's actually a, you know that's a common theme for god and and his dealing with the people of israel was to give something and take something away or to give them something take away the enemy to realize it or to uh pronounce that israel had sinned and take away something from them and give it to their enemy for instance, it's a very common theme. It's just very direct here where he opened the eyes for the spiritual via the servant and then closed the eyes of the, the enemy from physical um, awareness. So Elisha told them, this is not the road. This is not the city. Thou read, so he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha had asked, I believe I did. Elisha said, this is not the road. This is not the city. Follow me and I'll lead you the man you're looking for kind of a classic deception for spiritual purposes. And he led them to Samaria. Now, Samaria was the home capital of Israel and therefore would be, you know, the presence of Israelite, Israeli now, Israelite then soldiers. And in fact, is at play right now in the ongoing near war in the Middle East at the moment, though it's not called Samaria now, but they entered the city Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he said. Would you kill men you've captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. So this is a good peaceful ending. He led the blind people into the city, um, and then when they opened their eyes, God allowed them some mercy, which wasn't always the case in Old Testament times, for sure. But he, he allowed them that mercy, which I think was um, very impressive. So the, um, 
going back to the angels that the servants saw around the mountainside, does that fit the modern day perception of guardian angel? No. Johnny, you know me if you want to say more than, yeah. Well, it doesn't seem to me because it wasn't like an individual guardian angel for an individual person. For one right. I, and I would agree. I think, I think it's interesting that this passage is frequently referred to as a, you know, kind of, oh, you know, we have guardian angels like Elisha showed the servant, or at least I've run across it. And it's interesting to me, too, that in mentioning this, uh, back to verse 17, Lord opened his eyes so you may see. The Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire. Yeah. I'm stopping there for a second. Because that would sort of be like what I think we could perceive always of God's power. I don't know how else we can see God's power than something like that. Lightning bolts, maybe. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just hard to define. But then, of course, there's this little phrase here that he saw these chariots of fire all around Elisha. You know, it's interesting. Maybe this was the just the him showing the servant, God allowing the servant to see that God was with Elisha. Not guardian angel-wise, but just the presence of the power of God with Elisha. And I think that's a pretty interesting one. Who knows another example, or who has any other thought? Any other thought on that? And then I'll move on to the next thing. We're not finished with guardian angels by any means, but okay. I'll just go ahead and mention that or ask anybody having any other example of a guardian angel in the Bible. Now, that you know what I hear mentioned sometimes is well, I'll think about Balaam. You know, Balaam was riding the donkey in the Angels stopped Balaam from going. Uh, but, you know, he stopped him from going so that he wouldn't go and sin against God. It wasn't like there was another chariot coming that was about to run over Balaam and he stopped him so that the chariot went on by and he protected him like a guardian angel. It was more a spiritual lesson to Balaam than it was, you know, kind of a guardian angel. So here's the challenge I find with guardian angels, and this is going to bleed over into our discussion of new angels or angels by perception in society right now. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to know my view. And my view is based on omission from the Bible. There is not an example in scripture of a guardian angel. And there's not a description in the Bible that says, once you become a Christian, your children will have guardian angels to protect them from all harm. And there's not a passage that says, be careful in traffic, but don't be too careful. You don't have to be too careful because I've got a guardian angel with you that's going to steer you away from catastrophic harm. Now, I believe God protects us in those ways. I have zero doubt that we will someday in, he in heaven be shocked by the number of times, if it's revealed to us, that we potentially could have had terrible harm. You know, when you're 16 and out hiking on the edge of a rocky precipice and you didn't fall and die, you know, I think that there are a number of things like that in our lives where God has protected us. I don't think it's a fair theology to view that as a guardian angel. And the reason for that is not only the fact that in scripture it's not mentioned, but my feeling that it's an ultimately unfair thing. Let's say you take two children and two sets of parents and they're out at a park playing and one of the kids, you know, stumbles off into the lake and before anybody sees them, they drown. And the other child, the only reason they know the child disappeared in the lake is because the other child maybe is teetering at the edge and almost falls in and then kind of comes back from the edge and is safe. And then the, the parents of the safe child would tend to say, oh, the guardian angel kept him from falling in that lake. Well, where does that lead that other person's guardian angel? You know, inept. I mean, it, it's really a difficult theology to think, oh, we have a protector from harm but I give that protector from harm an opportunity to protect and they fail. 
And then you don't say, oh, man, their guardian angel had that day off. It's unfortunate. You know, it, it's a weird theology, I think, to think about a special protection beyond the fact that God's in charge. And to me, that's a hugely special protection. But as I say frequently in many situations, God protects us spiritually from our souls being endangered in a way that would be out of our control. But I have never seen any particular scriptural evidence that God will protect us from any physical harm. And, you know, some, I think many times we're not harmed. I think it's probably incredible how many times we're not harmed in life. But I think it's also a reality that we can be harmed. And, you know, maybe even Satan and his minions have some degree of thought of, you know, this person's being particularly uh, efficient in evangelism. Let's hurt him. Kind of like Job's kids and Job's body when Job was attacked with the sores and he had to rub his sores with broken pottery. You know, it, he was spiritually protected, but he was physically manipulated into trying, Satan was trying to give him to blame God, and Job's wife was trying to give him to blame God and give up faith. But he kept his faith and recovered from that physically. And I think had he died from that, God would have him in heaven just the same. He would protect him spiritually, but he wouldn't necessarily protect him physically. So I think it's only fair to realize that... Um, you know, I think God provides a lot, more than we'll ever even realize. He provides a multitude of blessings. But my personal feeling is I think the idea of a guardian angel is a convenient one, but not a particularly theologically likely thing to have happen. And then to bleed that over, as I was saying, into the realm of angels, I read the obituaries frequently because I think they're fascinating. See what ends up being important in somebody's life at the point of their death and and sometimes it's very sad i mean you know i'll see stories where the you know the survivors are listed as a couple of faithful pets and then they'll mention you know and uh you know six grandchildren now think well whatever happened to the you know spouse child children whatever and uh but anyway i'm diver uh, uh digressing into obituaries but I also find it fascinating how many say God has a new angel in heaven because Bill has passed. And, you know, that's just not very sound theology either. Or, you know, that somebody was given their wings because they died in a, you know, they were good people and or whatever. And I find adventures, it's an infrequent thing or not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation that that person who's the new angel has any kind of a listing of any sort of church involvement, including a funeral service or a memorial service at anywhere than a funeral home or maybe their favorite bar. And, you know, it's kind of a, I think sad too, that maybe that's sort of a theology of, you know, false theology of, oh, well, this is a good person. They're surely an angel now, but they don't necessarily believe in the salvation of the soul and the presence of God forever. And that, to me, is so much reassuring, more reassuring, to think I'll be an honored soul of God's possession in heaven, rather than just being an angel who's assigned to be a servant to others. And so I think that's a bit of a flaw in spiritual thought, maybe a little bit of a flaw in the spiritual warfare deal that I, I don't see any evidence that there are new angels being produced by God. I think that the angels exist and Satan and his forces exist. And I don't see a new creation being made there. And certainly not a procreation of angel, angels reproducing. Charles? Uh, I think maybe where they get that is when, they're, when the uh, Pharisees are asking Jesus, about, maybe it's the, Sadd the Sadducees asking Jesus about the, the guy who's, uh, you know, he was married, yeah. his wife died, or he died. So right. his brothers, brothers and, they, and they say there'll be no marrying or giving you marriage, but we shall be like the angels. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't say how we will be like the angels, but good point. They probably, but I think that's probably as close to scripture to describe that. You're right, as we could. It's interesting when I see 
other scripture about you know resurrection including quite a few in revelation which are always a little bit hard to you know interpret but it always speaks of souls in those verses as opposed to angels and i think you know other than the angel sounding a trumpet for instance but it doesn't say the angel who was previously a really good guy died recently you know was blowing that trumpet and so i think it is I think you're right that that may be where that initially came from, but very much like I think the angel culture in America of, you know, kind of the beautiful figurine and the pleasant halo and the maybe some special skills that may come from God, but maybe just because they like somebody like, you know, the TV shows about angels that they just kind of get along so they end up helping somebody through their tough time you know that's that makes for a very nice story i suppose in many ways but i don't see it as a scriptural truth and so i just wanted to mention that one too so any other thoughts along those lines or no okay then um the next thing i would address because i don't want us to run out of time before we get there would be uh johnny had the question of whether angels know our thoughts and I think that is a very good <clears throat> question. Ah, we have a... Yeah, well, you suggested reading this book. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, I read it on page 64. Joe uh -huh. Beam says, if angels can communicate to us in our thoughts, it is logical to assume they can receive communication from, our, from us through our thoughts. And I don't know if that's biblically uh, provable yeah. or not. I, I yeah, It's I disturbing to me. I don't necessarily remember reading that, but I think you have a good question. I would say from scriptural examination and from at least my study through the years of scripture, I do not think that Satan can determine our thoughts. I think that many times our thoughts are involved in sin, but that's the whole realm of, you know, we've been separated from the presence of God through the original sin and the Garden of Eden of pride, of thinking we can know, uh, discern good and evil, know good and evil, like God, like the way the serpent in the garden tempted Eve and, and she ate and then Adam ate immediately after and they became um, aware. And I think because of our freedom in Christ with freedom of thought i think many times we do have thoughts that are um you know it, sin oriented i think that's what jesus was addressing in the sermon on the mount when he said you know you have heard do not commit adultery but i tell you it's a man who commits adultery in his heart or lust after an individual in his heart has committed adultery it's a thought process can lead to sin, but I don't think Satan can know that thought process and therefore further manipulate it. And that's what I would presume would be the benefit to Satan, because I think Satan knows that we frequently have thoughts that are not appropriate for godliness, but I don't think he can specifically manipulate those. And I would think that would be the case. So I think that if we look at a couple of scriptures on that, and if I don't knock over my lamp and like start a fire in here, you know, it always is a trouble on Westerns. They always burn down the barn by doing so. Um, if we look over at Genesis 6, <clears throat> um, verse 5, this is going back to the Nephilim discussion we had. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made the man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So in that verse, speaking of knowing the thoughts, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the heart of man was only evil all the time, I guess maybe it's an unfair extrapolation, but I would tend to think that if Satan also knew those thoughts and knew his, you know, being on the edge of a significant spiritual victory here, I think that would probably be mentioned. You know, I think it's interesting that God knew the thoughts of the people. The Lord knew the thoughts. 
but he he doesn't make any mention of you know the thoughts of man were known to Satan. And so then looking over, and this may be a, a poor context for the for, uh, for this discussion, but I think it's fair because I think David was a man after the heart of God. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, I think he had a lot of insights into his, from his walk with God that was very significant compared to most every other created soul. So I'll read it, Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me. And you know me, you know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going down and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a Lord, uh, before, a Lord, Lord before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. So I would think there again that perhaps in all the many struggles that David had trying to do the right thing, thought, failing to do the right thing, knowing that he was, you know, often in sin and struggling with the right pursuit of God. I sort of feel like he would have said, you know, between God and Satan, knowing my thoughts, it's amazing I'm still alive or something like that. But he says God knew his every thought and even position and i think that was interesting you discern my going out and my lying down you're familiar with all my ways you know we've talked about god as god as jehovah god is omniscient omnipresent and that those are characteristics that satan does not have satan cannot be everywhere by my view uh, or my study of scripture i think it seems quite clear that satan can go from place to place and there's that you know, very fair possibility that Satan is not near us at the moment, for instance. Now that, you know, that doesn't mean there's not sin in the world, sinful thought. That doesn't mean there aren't evil beings and evil influences and traps that he has set up for us to see something and lust or see something and have greed or see somebody and have envy. You know, I think all those things are out there as sin potentials for us but i don't think satan is present with each of them i think that may be a, a big difference there too so i think that god knows our thoughts and our place and i think that satan has to go to and fro on the earth like is described in job one and two and so my answer to that johnny would be i don't think that he knows our thoughts i think he knows he can throw our thoughts off of god very well i think he knows he has certain successes but going back to the issue of the prophecy from the garden of eden about i will crush your you will crush his heel but i will crush your head i believe referring to the death burial resurrection of jesus i really think that when satan influenced the people in judaism who four days before had selected Jesus as the Hosanna Lord, you know, Palm Sunday entry King of the Jews as Pilate made fun of, but was true. I think that by four days later, when they shouted to crucify him and let the sorry guy uh, Barabbas go instead of Jesus, I think that Satan thought he had a victory. I think he had, he thought he had the ultimate victory by killing God. And then when God rose from the, and that was the bruising of the heel of God, but I think when Jesus rose from the dead, that was crushing the head of Satan with the realization that, no, you are always going to be subservient. You can try to get souls, but you are never going to be God. And I think that's really what that boiled down to. So any other thoughts from any of you along those lines? And about Satan knowing not, thoughts or other scriptures saying, that bring not just saying but all angels all of his demons hopefully none of them have access to our thoughts you know that only God does yeah I think I really do believe that to be true I think that um undoubtedly I think both angels and whether you want to view Satan as angel or or not you know we've discussed all that but 
uh, you know, presumably he was a cherubim at some point, which is a type of angel, it seems. We don't understand all that. But I think if you look at all that spiritual realm, I think undoubtedly they know what makes people rebel against God. And they manipulate that very well. But of actually knowing our thoughts, I really don't think that that's the case. I think that is a soul issue between us and God. And I think it's very important. This gets to our last point that I think is uh, important in study of spiritual warfare is what to do about <clears throat> this um, spiritual warfare and the fact that Satan's after our soul. And I think one of the most important is to guard our thoughts, guard our hearts, as we're told in scripture, which I think hearts there meaning thoughts, of course, and the soul. Keep your soul on track with the proper thoughts. Now, easier said than done, no doubt. All it takes, I find in, you know, all of us is one brief, you know, image of something that to kind of diverts us from God's plan and or from God's will for us. And so I think it's very important to keep our focus on God as much as we can. I think that's what leads to verses like Paul's admonition to pray without ceasing it. First Thessalonians 5, 17 is to keep in prayer. I think that's why Jesus said at the Sermon on the Mount, pray for your enemies because you can dwell on an enemy and they can make you into a hateful person. If you, you know, dwell on how bad they've been, how much you hate them, whatever, if you pray for them, you can't say angry. And I think all those verses about prayer are extremely important. Now, I think that it is most concise over at Ephesians 6. And I, this is probably the most appropriate wrap up of um, spiritual warfare discussion, but I want to reread. We've read a, a bit of it in the prior um, <clears throat> lessons in this series, but I think understanding the um, armor of God is extremely important in using the approach that Paul teaches. So quick background, I know I only have the 14 minutes to go through the armor of God, and I think that's okay. But um, we, when we look at Ephesians, you know, I think a few things are important to remember. One is Ephesus was the city where uh, Paul was nearly killed by the mob because the silversmiths who made the uh, worship items for the false goddess Demetria, and Demetrius and um, uh, uh, was the, uh, in the Temple of Diana. Thank you. I couldn't think of that name for a second, but the, um, when you look at the fact that there was spiritual warfare in Ephesus with a temple to a false goddess and then the presence of Paul and his friends in their evangelizing, and he spent three years in Ephesus. So the people he wrote this letter to were not brand new to the idea of Christianity. They had had to deal with sport, spiritual warfare. And I think that's why, you know, back in chapter two, he mentions the prince of the air. And when we talk like, for instance, in um, the, about the mystery of the church and the mystery of Christ, uh, verse uh, 532 is a, uh, an example, this is a profound mystery. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Uh, each of you must love his wife as himself. The wife must respect her husband. Children must obey their parents in the Lord for this is right. That's chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor, when their eyes on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, so serve wholeheartedly <coughs> as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether you slave or free, masters treat your slaves, right? All this is there because I think the people had had about three years to mature in their relationships with one another, with Christ, with the community they were trying to evangelize. And they knew there were a lot of battles going on for their souls. And I think that leads to this uh, passage in Ephesians 6, at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Excuse me a second. Got to re moisten the old boys. <clears throat> be, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your sand against the devil's schemes. 
for our struggles, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I think that this is surely something that Paul had taught them about over time. I think they saw it directly. I think if we had, you know, across the street from Saturn Road, if we had a, you know, a temple to uh, Krishna right there or whatever, I think we could further understand the direct impact of that. Whereas when we keep it a little bit of a distance, it's a little harder sometimes to see that. But the battle is against all of these forces, powers of, of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belts of truth buckled around your waist. Think about that belt of truth as what I think of it as anyway. And maybe this would be a helpful image, but I think of a police officer's belt. I see a number of police officers as patients, and it's always fascinating to me when they come in, take off a little bit of gear. I'm surprised my cabinet doesn't collapse under the weight of everything they have on there. You know, it can be, you know, gun and holster, um, taser, uh, baton, handcuffs, radio, phone, you know, you name it. Uh, you know, a hand tool to cut away cords, whatever, zip ties. I mean, they got everything on there. And always think about that with this, that if we have that belt, <clears throat> excuse me, belt of truth, we have the tools we need to fight spiritual warfare, to fight against Satan, and to invoke God, God's gifts to us as tools that we can use against Satan. And it's interesting, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, there's the horrible situation of a police officer killing an individual and she pulled her gun and shot him. And she said, oh, I thought I pulled my taser and fired it. And, you know, the onus would be on her to know the difference between her gun and her taser. And I think that's kind of like our tools. I think we need to know the tools that God's given us in order to function in this spiritual warfare. So looking past the belt there, uh, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, you know, it, it, we all know that the trunk of the body is very valuable in terms of preserving health. And, you know, if you take a wound to the chest or abdomen, frequently that's a fatal wound or ex extremely debilitating. When you see a TV show where somebody shot in the chest four times and they go on and fight some more, that's not reality. I mean, it is... Uh, it is frequently a fatality when you take a wound to the chest because there's so much that can be altered, severed, uh, destroyed. And, you know, thinking back even, for instance, as an example, to the death of Princess Diana, you know, when the, the people first arrived on the scene right after her horrific wreck in the tunnel in France, they initially said, oh, it looks like she's okay. Let's, you know, get her to the hospital, resuscitate her. Well, Within a couple of minutes, she was dead because her aorta had been severed away from the exiting point of the heart. And that was simply a high impact wound to the chest that severed her aorta from her heart. And you cannot live in that situation. And so if you think about <clears throat> the breastplate of righteousness protecting all the critical organs, that obviously righteousness being the pursuit of Christ's likeness in everything you do that's going to help preserve your spiritual life. And the then looking at the next one, which I think um, is really the one that we maybe kind of overlook sometimes. So we have the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. I think most of us could name that. Um, and then with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. I think that's maybe the one that we forget, the boot the shoe, the whatever it is that would be fitted with peace in the gospel of, or it fitted, uh, what's the, what was the word, fitted with readiness, excuse me, that comes from the gospel of peace. And the way I think of this is, in a battle, you can, you basically do one of four things. You can advance, you can retreat, you can drop to the ground, or you can sand your ground. 
notice that he just said stand when at verse 13 put on the form of god so when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand stand firm then and go down to verse 15 with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace knowing christ through the gospels is such a benefit in spiritual warfare we must know he whom we serve and i think it is fascinating to me here he doesn't say when spiritual battle gets difficult run away he doesn't say run towards satan and attack him he doesn't say drop and pretend nothing's happening he says stand and stand in the gospel of peace and i think of that as the peace that passes understanding that God will give us what we need in that time. But if we stand rooted in the gospel with the realization that God's in charge, <clears throat> that is going to be <clears throat> excuse me, a tremendous spiritual benefit. And then in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. So this is the first of two, sorry, off of the body armor pieces, the sword and the shield. So in addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, I've mentioned before, I view this as Satan and his forces shooting every flaming arrow at us that they can in order to try to find a gap in that armor, a gap in the breastplate of righteousness and a, a gap somewhere in the, you know, the, the where the belt should have been placed and it wasn't or whatever. And when he's shooting these arrows in, the faith, can help you thin them off, as you say, rooted in the gospel of peace. And I think that shield of faith is critical in that. And you know, it's if you look at an arrow, it's hard to believe that an old wooden arrow from Paul's day would be an item of destruction. But keep in mind that changed war when the arrow was put into use. And when the flaming arrow was put into use, it made the army with flaming arrow um, <clears throat> archers who could shoot with accuracy and repetitive motion it made those armies almost un insurmountable and you know looking now we might say this is more like the artillery shell or the you know whatever the the weapon would be it'd be a bit different probably for our era but at that time that was the artillery shell and that shield of faith can fend that off and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So I'm going to go over what Hebrews 4, I believe, is the sword, is the word of God. Let me turn there real quick. And I'll wrap this up here in just a second. Don't, uh, don't quit now. The, um, except that somebody took Hebrews out of my Bible. Can you agree? There it is. <laughs> Hebrews 4. Okay. Uh, Hebrews, um, uh, four is not the right. Where did it go? I've lost the sword of the spirit. That's a bad sign. Um, we're going to find that here in a second. Double edged sword. Yeah. It is four twelve. Okay, thank you. I looked too quickly. <laughs> well, the ah, thing yes, was, is I had it highlighted, so I found it quick. Excellent. I, that's a lesson for me. Mine's just sitting there in black and white. And it's just <laughs> <laughs> Hebrews 4.12. Uh, the word of the Lord is, a li is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of physical and spiritual both. The what? I'm sorry. Okay. Maybe I misheard something. Um, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes to him, of him to whom we must give account. So you could look at that and think, boy, the sword is too risky because it lays bare everything to God. And maybe I don't want to be judged for what everything is. But on the other hand, you could say, oh, this sword is so great because it divides out right from wrong bone from marrow joint from tissue soul from spirit which is an interesting phrase but it it is our way to discern the truth 
and God knows the truth anyway. Don't be afraid of things being laid bare before God because they're going to be anyway. Be his and you don't have to fear that. And <clears throat> through his grace. So when we look at this, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, uh, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. Notice that mentions three times prayer, and I'm going to mention the fourth in a minute. But I want to point out what I kind of blew past there on purpose. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. What then is the helmet of salvation? If you think about that, to me, that armor is the cognitive awareness that God is in charge. I think if you think about the head and the brain and protect the brain spiritually, I think that is guard your heart, your thoughts, keep your thoughts right, keep your intellect where it should be, which is God-given and focus on God and learn things that are of value, think about things that are of value, think about prayer all the time, uh, process mentally the truths of God. Don't be caught unaware and unable, 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 one of those, to be to uh, be able to uh, present truth at any time, maybe as importantly to yourself as others when you're under attack spiritually. And I think it's critical to just realize God's in charge, and amazingly, God has made himself 100% available to us in prayer at any time. And we never have a reason we cannot pray to the God of the universe. And I find that to be an incredible reality that gets you through any spiritual crisis. Present things before God. So when he says, put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, I think that is that emphasis of realize who is in charge. He's bigger than any of us. He's bigger than Satan, bigger than false gods, bigger than demons, bigger than temptation itself. And <clears throat> then he says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. That doesn't say we're limited. It says pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me. This is the fourth mention of prayer in a brief couple of sentences. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I think if Paul, the great evangelist and the one who saw Jesus in the light and was blinded and was brought back to sight and was baptized and taught um, it was tortured, was bitten by a snake, was shipwrecked, was beaten, was stoned, all these things. If he is requesting prayer, then that emphasizes even more to me how much it's a value to pray for each other. Don't decide someone else is fine. Pray for him anyway. Don't decide you're fine, per se. Just keep praying to God that he'll lead you through life's journey. And I think it's interesting. I also think Paul is an incredible teacher. And I think he doesn't accidentally say, pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given so that I fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I think the, the physical nature of that comment is, yes, he was in chains. He was imprisoned at the time. The spiritual lesson in that is we all should be praying that we can fearlessly present the, uh, the mystery of the gospel to others and teach them. And I think this was his way of saying, you do what I do and pray for me. I'll pray for you. Pray for all saints. Pray always. Pray in all things because we all need to be aware of this spiritual battle for our souls and be ready to combat that through the strength of God. So that's what I had hoped to probably throw in last couple of weeks ago and kind of forgot. But the uh, I think that's a critical way to combat 
uh, spiritual warfare and the fact that Satan wants your soul is turn to him with God. And I think it's important to realize God's the one giving that strength. You will not personally ever want to encounter Satan and not have God and his strength with you. I think that is clear too, spiritually speaking. And I think we need to be aware that we are gods, gods with us, and we should properly lean on him to guide us through life struggles. <clears throat> Any other thoughts on that? And now I'll wrap us up. Yeah, well, you, okay. Well, certainly if you have anything else, um, you know, come up over time again, pass on a question or, or we'll have another uh, pseudo session if we need to or whatever, but I don't want to consider this the end of thinking about how we deal with spiritual warfare. I think, I think it's really important to keep in mind the principles that we can learn and utilize them. And, and, you know, this crazy little deal of life that we do, um, you don't know what's going to happen to try to detract you from your faith at any given moment and i think it's always a value to be ready for that so uh, as always it's such a blessing to me that you joined in i appreciate each of you and let's pray and and uh close from there